All right, Andrew. I'm so excited for this episode. We talked to Tato. We talk all about her journey acquiring a business, a very small business, and growing it and all the struggles, challenges along the way. We talk about balancing personal life, you know, relationships going, you know, uh, towards marriage and children and how that how to balance two entrepreneurial journeys in that mix. Like there's so many good things I couldn't put them out. So fun. Listen to the whole thing. I will caution you. We believe in allowing everyone to be authentic on this podcast. Um, if you don't like the F word, don't listen to this podcast because um, it is in here a couple of times. But yeah, we just want to encourage authenticity. And Tato is the most authentic of people. And so it's just really cool to see her journey. The realest of the real. Here it comes. Welcome to So You Can Grow a podcast for entrepreneurs where we confront the sacred cows of business, share our insights, and talk to insightful guests, all with the goal of helping you grow and prosper. What's up, everybody? It's Andrew Smith. Welcome to So You Can Grow. Joined today, as always, by Lucas Mitchell. Lucas, what is happening? Uh, not much other than we just had to restart this podcast episode. So I feel like I'm repeating myself and hopefully my original excitement comes through as authentically as it did the first time. But I'm just so excited to have our guest. Uh, she's been a friend of mine for a long time. We both got busy running businesses and we haven't reconnected in quite a while. And so I'm just really excited to catch up with Tato and yeah, see how she's doing. Check in on her on her business successes, wins failures, all the good stuff. Thanks, guys. Hey, I'm so excited. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. We are thrilled to have you on. Um, like Lucas said, longtime um, friend and supporter of Nourish and Sew, and we're excited to, to hear about your journey, and you've been doing a lot. Um, so we'll kind of jump in. I want to hear, just allow you to tell our audience a little bit about you, uh, your backstory, how you started your, your journey. And then how you ended up today where you are with uh, Brant Molded Marble. Yeah. Well, in a really, really succinct nutshell, um, I was born and raised in California, uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And I joined the tech world out of co college, which is what a lot of people my age do. Um, I worked at a company called Salesforce for almost 10 years. Um, had a great career there. Had lots of different uh, jobs while I was there and kind of, you know, rose the ladder, so to speak. Um, I like to say I kind of grew up there. Like I started there when I was 21 turning 22 and um, ultimately left my job um, at about 30. So just had like a great stretch of time and all kinds of world experiences. Um, but I always knew I was going to go work for myself. I didn't really know like how that was going to manifest. Um, but honestly, COVID ended up being like my secret blessing. Um, my little sister had migrated to the Midwest. Um, she was, she had just got married. She was, uh, buying a house and raising family in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and so, during the COVID shutdown, I actually ended up spending a ton of time out here. She had just had um, our family's first grandbaby. And so, um, you know, I was just working remotely out here for Salesforce. And I realized that I could start investing in real estate, which is not something that I ever was going to or never say never, but I probably was never going to pick that up in California for just a whole slew of reasons. Um, and so I cashed out the Salesforce stock that I had built up to that point and bought my first rental. And I became obsessed, like completely obsessed, fell down the real estate rabbit hole, um, which is how I met you wonderful people. Um, and I always, I always say real estate is my, is my first love. It's my true love. Like I just really, really enjoy it. Um, and spent, uh, the couple years of COVID doing all, all the real estate things, you name it, I did it, uh, buy and hold flip wholesale, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I had great success, but I realized that to replace my W-2 income, especially like my tech income, um, was not going to happen quickly enough with real estate acquisition, at least not the way that I was doing it. I, I truly believe there are ways that you can, but I wasn't on that trajectory and whatever. So um, around the same time, I was uh, really involved in the mastermind group that I met you guys through. And there were some people, Lucas included, um, who were, you know, buying businesses. And I was like, oh, cool. I don't know anything about that kind of, you know, 
asked around, picked the brains of those I trusted, um, read Buy Then Build, which is kind of like the Rich Dad Poor Dad for business buying. It's like the Bible, you know, it's where a lot of people start. Um, made a ton of sense to me. Um, I had a couple of people be like, oh my gosh, you could totally do this. You have the personality and skill set for it. And I'm just a very like, I'm going to do it person. And then if it's a complete fucking disaster, I'll figure it out. But like, hopefully it's not. Um, and I'll learn a bunch along the way. So, um, and that's how I approached real estate and how I learned everything I learned there. And that's how I approached this. Um, and I've learned everything I've learned the last few years. So, um, my search was a long story and we can get into it, but in a nutshell, I actually ended up finding a business that I purchased just for the real estate value. So I actually only have a real estate loan on this business, um, even though I took everything else. So it was what what felt like the the most risk averse way for me to enter this new space that I didn't know anything about um, and kind of get into it knowing, okay, if I'm a terrible business owner and I burn it to the ground tomorrow, I at least have you know a building that I can rent and I'm at least really comfortable with that. So that is a really long story in like 90 seconds. That's that's so cool though. I love the backstories because it's always like, I think there's like a, a large, you know, group of people that can't figure out that transition from like, especially high paying jobs yeah. are the hardest to leave. Like they, they yep, call them golden sure. handcuffs for the reason. Cause like, how do you mm-hmm. leave that income? So this is going to be super yep. valuable to a ton of people. Um, and I think, you know, the way that you went about it, you you know, I think I was one of those people who also told you like, yeah, Tato, you could totally do this. You, you're totally cut from the right cloth. Um, but man. just like that, yes. that, that desire to like get in there and just, I'm just going to do it and we're just mm-hmm. going to figure it out. And like, no, no hesitancy. I can remember some of our conversations, like when you were going through the process of actually acquiring the business and like, you know, hearing the fear in your voice and also the excitement at the same time. Yeah. And I'm like, yep, yep. She's going to be able to do it. Like, you know, the people you talk to where all you hear is the fear in their voice or all you hear is the excitement and you don't hear the balance of both. You're yeah. like, eh, That's so eh, true. not, not so yep. sure this is for you. Um, but, but you were yeah, like the perfect totally. balance. Of like, think- I'm terrified and thrilled at the same time. Oh, thanks. And I think like, <laughs> not to like get in too deep in the first two minutes, but what I have found talking to a lot, I, I've had the privilege to be on a lot of these podcasts now. And so naturally you get inbound from people who listen to the podcast. They're interested in doing something similar that you did and they reach out, you know, wanting to pick your brain. And what I, I get like a couple of recurring themes, but I feel like one recurring theme is that people are like, they're waiting for some sort of instance or opportunity where it's clear and makes sense to them and they have no fear going into it. Right. And so like, that's, what's preventing them from taking the step. Cause they just haven't found like that opportunity. That's like, you know, the thing that they're like, Oh, this is totally it. Like I'm not worried at all. And that just doesn't exist in my opinion. Or if it does, then it's not challenging enough. Right. Um, so yeah, like if, if you really think this is for you and you're actually going to take the step into it, like fearlessness is just required. It's the, it's the price of entry. Yeah. You, and I always tell people like, you've got to be, um, just willing to go all in and not be afraid of getting punched in the mouth. Yeah. And like, just, yep. you, it's like the self-confidence piece I think is the biggest piece of it where it's like, I know hard things are going to happen. I know I can't predict the future. I know I can't project exactly what's going to happen, but whatever's going to happen, I know I can figure it out. Like that's the most important part. Yeah. And some people yeah, have that. Absolutely. Other people don't. I would say if you're feeling all fear and you're not like optimistic about your ability to handle the challenges, I would say probably work on your self worth and self confidence first. Yeah. And then maybe mm-hmm. look at entrepreneurship as the path. But yeah, I'm really excited to get into like how yep. you've progressed since the acquisition. Yeah. Just because I was like I was already privy to like your journey into the acquisition and and I know like where you were at then and I'm so eager to like understand what you've done since then like how how is the business going what were the first like several months like versus how does it feel now like what was it like when you bought it what have you changed like there's so many questions i could answer i'm asking them all at once but that's kind of the direction i want to go yes okay cool where do you want to start andrew where do you want to start i think a good spot (laughs) yeah 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 Yeah. let's let's go (laughs) i think a good spot is you kind of the you talked about buy then build and a lot of that is around acquisition right like mm-hmm. how do you how did you become to be interested in this specific business that you own and maybe we can kind of start there and then zoom in you know pre-purchase pre-acquisition and then post-acquisition how you've kind of been able to reshape it 
from the yeah. inside. I, I am just a painfully honest person. I am not going to paint this anything other than what it is. I didn't know the first thing about this business. I could not have possibly told you in honesty what I felt was promising about it. I was eager to do a transaction and this had the least downside risk financially. Everything is going to have downside risk in terms of your time and your sanity. Um, but strictly dollars, this had the least downside risk of anything because it was just a building purchase and I got everything else with it. I didn't even pay for the actual manufacturing equipment. Um, so I got the building, the manufacturing equipment, and then obviously, you know, the goodwill, if you will. Um, so, you know, in hindsight, there are lots of things about this business that I'm growing it upon that are exciting and trackable and, um, you know, things that I, I could have seen during due diligence, which would have been legitimate reasons to buy the business. But I would be an absolute liar if I told you like, oh, yeah, here are all the ways I was going to grow up, blah, blah, blah. No, I literally had no idea what the fuck I was doing. I just wanted to buy a business because I don't like to like, oh, I don't like to overeducate. Like I can educate to an extent, but if I don't do it, then it's like, I'm just wasting my time. And so I wanted to just do it and just see how it went. See what was on the other side. Oh, that was a bargain. I love that answer too. And I will caution anyone looking to buy a business. If you're talking with anyone and they try to tell you that they knew what they were getting into before they bought their first business, they're lying. They're lying. Nobody does. Yeah, I don't I care if you more. know the industry. Like I ran restaurants for 10 years yep. before I bought my first five restaurants. I had no idea what I was getting into when I actually bought the businesses for yep. myself as opposed to running them for somebody else. So yep. I don't care what anybody tells you mark. until you buy that first business. You don't know. You have no idea. Yep. And, and everybody comes in kind of in the same place. And maybe after you bought a second or a third company and you start to get some experience, then maybe you start to really hone in on like, oh, here's some levers I'll be able to pull to make this a cool deal. Or here's some things that they're not doing that I yeah. can do. But until you buy that, until you have that experience, nobody knows. Nobody knows. So I appreciate yep. the honesty. That's how you can tell someone's honest about <laughs> buying business. It's a very simple way. Ask them. Did you know what uh, the upside was going to be when you bought the business? If they say yes, mm -hmm. they're lying. <laughs> mostly, mm -hmm. least, mostly lying. Yep. Yep. I love that. I love awesome. that. So, so wait, Tato, wait, wait, really quick. You Andrew, bought it. I, took I wanna, the leap. Right. Sorry, Andrew. One thing really quick. No, I want to focus on something Tato did too, which I think a lot of people are not necessarily good at. I don't even know if you knew that you did this, Tato, but... Tato knew she had oh a competitive advantage already, but it wasn't in like her actual business. It was in real estate. So she was able to find mm. a deal that gate that set her up for success, whether she succeeded in the business or not. You know, my competitive advantage when I bought my business was I already knew how to run restaurants. So I'm like, at least at a bare minimum, yeah. I can run good restaurants and I can hire somebody mm -hmm. to help me figure out the business side if I need that. Tato's competitive yep. advantage in being successful was I know real estate. I know what the value of this real estate's worth. I know what I can lease it for. I know I can lease it. So if I completely fail at the business, I own a property, you know, and the property is mm -hmm. in cash flow, or I can sell the property and get my money back or whatever. She had exit contingencies, right? So I would say that's the best way. No, but you're never going to mm -hmm. know going into a business what that's going to look like. But what do you know about yourself? What competitive advantages do you have that you can leverage to make the transaction feel a little bit more secure? And even yep. if all you're doing is tricking yourself, it works to help, you know, take you over that, yeah. that line. Agreed. Agreed. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Lucas, thanks for, you know, pointing that out. I think what can be very useful for our listeners, I guess, here is like, okay, so Tato bought this thing. This business, this building, the building's the, the exit plan if, mm -hmm. if everything goes wrong, but you still have this business, right? That is, you know, Brant molded marble. Mm -hmm. I saw, I remember when you bought it, I saw it online uh, on LinkedIn and I was like, I didn't know Tato was into molded marble. I was like, where's Didn't know manufacturing was her thing. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's, you're kind of in a, in a space that maybe you weren't super familiar with, but. Yeah. You know, I, that's where, that's where I'm intrigued in your, in your story, like breaking into a new industry, um, and then having this like pretty specific niche where, you know, I've seen you kind of overcome some challenges and break into some new markets and bring some new ideas and new technologies into, into this. So that's really where I want to hear you, hear you go next. Well, I think that, um, 
I'm, I serve as a great example for people who, who don't have really any applicable experience they can take to business acquisition. Um, like for example, um, if you went, if you went to school for accounting and you have been a CPA for somebody for a long time and you decide, you know what, I want to do this for my own, but instead of starting up my own book of business, I'm going to go buy somebody else's. That's like, that makes a ton of sense, right? That's a very linear path. Um, you will probably be very successful and I'm, I'm sure things will come your way that, you know, are challenging, but like you generally understand the foundation of what it is that you're doing. A lot of us don't have that for whatever reason. It's not like you did anything wrong in life, but you just don't have those hard skills that you can translate to, you know, some sort of like obvious acquisition. And I think that that can be a stopping point for a lot of people. And so I really try to serve as um, an example of um, you can still go do it. So that was a long winded intro to your question of, um, you know, like how I broke into the space. Well, I was going to have to break into any space, right? Um, Yes, I had a lot of real estate experience under my belt. Um, I did consider going to be a realtor, so I could have done that. That's you. It's you can argue whether that's business ownership or not. Whatever. Um, I could have bought a property management company. Even that, though, that really isn't real estate acquisition, right? That that is completely like its own its own beast. Um, I was going to have to learn that from scratch. So, like, I was going to have to learn anything from scratch. Um, and so when I was searching, I was like, okay, what are the things that sound learnable, you know? Um, and that kind of dictated my search and it was the most random smattering of things like laundromats. I was like, that seems really learnable, right? Uh, RV campgrounds seems really learnable. I had a couple others that I was like, I can probably learn about this. Ironically, manufacturing was not one of them. And I actually turned down the proposal to consider this business initially. Um, the gentleman who was uh, selling it. He was selling it through a broker and I was introduced to the broker. We had a nice conversation. He pitched me on this business and I was like, Oh, I, I pretty much know nothing about everything, but I definitely know nothing about that. So, you know, that's a no go for me. Um, but the reason that we ended up over the finish line is because he called me like a month later and he was like, Hey, remember that thing we talked about? Well, they're going to close in two weeks. So I'm sure you don't want to add a minimum, come walk around the building, you know, check it out, whatever. Um, and so I did, and the rest is history. Um, and you know, he was in a position where he had no other offers. So I knew that I could just offer him land value and was probably going to be successful, but, um, yeah, anything was going to be a new landscape. And, um, I think I just like, just knew that, right. Like I just like accepted it. Yeah. That's so cool. I think one of the things you said that I want to point out to listeners and just kind of highlight is like you were talking specifically about like you didn't have hard skills that you could translate to mm -hmm. successful business ownership. Like I did the contrast with that was like I had hard skills running restaurants that I could translate to business. Ownership. You said you didn't have that. But what I will point out is like for on the, the next thing you said, and you didn't say it this specifically, but this is what I understood of like you did have those soft skills, right, which is the most important mm -hmm. part about business ownership. You had right. grit. You had ability to lead people. You had ability to get people to buy into your vision and communicate vision. And you had those mm -hmm. kinds of soft skills that translate well to business ownership. And so if you're finding yourself in a position like Tato was where I don't have a skill that translates to business ownership, it's like, well, think about the skills that you do have if you led people. Like, do you like even if it's a volunteer organizations, yeah. right? Like what skills focus on the skills you do have mm -hmm. that can translate to business ownership instead of the ones that don't because you can be successful. And I've seen a lot of people lately talking about like, what can go wrong in business ownership if you buy a business and put debt on it, and don't understand the industry. And there is a lot of validity to the, you know, cautionary tale, if you will, that people are saying. But I'd also like to highlight Tato is the perfect example of somebody that was able to do that without understanding the industry and was able to figure it out because she had those soft skills and because she understood an advantage that she had over other people because the seller was in a position where they didn't have a lot of negotiating leverage. It was kind of like, take it or I'm closing it down. So, you know, what do you want to give me yeah. for it? And so I think kind of th that culmination of that things helped make it successful, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And to that point, I obviously didn't have to get an SBA loan um, for my situation, but I have talked to tons of people who have. And it's kind of a shame that 
that seems to be one of the primary stipulations of SBA, right? Like, what's your industry experience, um, you know, or do you have a key man or whatever? Um, you know, I would have, I would have failed miserably. I probably wouldn't have obtained a loan. Um, and to your point, it, yeah, it's beneficial to have industry experience, but it's so far from the most important thing. I've always had this ability to sell myself. Um, in fact, I, I, never forget there was a specific instance when i was at salesforce i was trying to move on from my first role that i had there um i was trying to move up into uh, a position where it was still administrative but it was in the executive suite um so even though you were doing a quote unquote low paid you know lower level job it was for our for our executive suite which is where i ended up being in my career most of the time but when i was trying to get that first job i was 23 and i showed up to the interview in hindsight, by the way, I'm pretty sure this was like huge age discrimination, but whatever. I showed up to the interview <laughs> and my future boss was really transparent with me. He was like, I really think that you're too young, you know, for this role, we need somebody with, with a lot of maturity. And I was like, you know, that's kind of bullshit because I'm more mature than most people my age. So why don't you figure out how to give me some, some chance, right? Some duration of time or whatever. And I guarantee you, I'm going to surprise you anyway. So I got the job and I ended up, um, doing that for the rest of my career and got, you know, several levers of promotions and stuff, but I was able to show up, be, you know, be the, be myself, but also be that elevated presence that I knew was required for that particular position. And, um, you know, convince them to give me a chance. That's been absolutely no different than what I've done here the last two years. And that's a really tough thing to quantify. And it's a tough thing to write a loan based off of, but it's arguably the most important thing, you know? Yeah. Well, and I would say too, even just yeah. like, you know, when you're negotiating the transaction, even it's like, you know, so many people even struggle to get brokers to believe that they could execute on a transaction, right? That confidence yeah. that you have and yeah. that just a, that presence of like, Hey, mm -hmm. you know, when I bought my first deals is similar. I, I literally told the sellers, like, I have no idea I'm going to buy this, but I can figure it out. I promise you, I can figure it out. If yep. you give me the time, I'll figure it out. And so I think that's a common thread yep. amongst people who are able to go from, you know, career employee yeah. to W2 is like, you might not have the hard skills, but like, what do you have? Like, look at what you have and bring that yeah. to the table, you know, start the conversations. Don't be yeah. afraid of rejection. You know, all of those kinds of things. So amazing. Amazing. Andrew, this Absolutely. is going to just blow people's minds. I know. <laughs> um, Tater, what have been some of those specific challenges, you know, as high as you want to get or as, as specific as you want to get, I guess? Um, yes, aside from everything, um, <laughs> I would say that my, my single biggest challenge has been learning how to lead a company. Um, how do I say this? Like, so from the beginning, I, I didn't even manage an intern at Salesforce, much less any people or any size of a team. Okay. Zero people management skills. I then bought a really small business that had only a few employees, which is kind of a whole other ball of wax, but I bought a really small business and it was life or death for me to earn their trust and earn, frankly, their likeness, right? Like you really can't begin to trust or respect somebody if you don't at least like, like them in general, right? Well, how do you be likable? Will you befriend people? Okay. Well, how do you delineate, you know, friend and boss? What are, you have to start somewhere though. You need people to want to show up for you every day. Mm -hmm. And, um, I did that really well. I was able to retain my employees and, um, I have ultimately promoted one of them into being really like my right hand man and my business partner. Um, but <sighs> There's so much to like figuring out how to make people like you trust you, but then also respect you delineate the fact that you're the leader and the decision maker. And there are rules and procedures and policies that everyone has to, you know, uh, abide by and yada, yada. Um, so yeah, I've kind of had to like grow up as, um, as a leader here. I made this metaphor this one time to an employee, I think it was like very lost on them. So it was like a shoe and mouth moment, but I meant it. it. It was like, it was like I was a teenage mom, right? Like I was totally unfit to manage people. I had no idea what the fuck I was doing, but I was going to make it work and I was going to give them the best life possible, you know? Um, 
But as you grow bigger and you hire more people, uh, you really do have to put kind of a boundary between them and you for the sake of everyone's success. Um, and that's hard for me because I'm a very like, I don't see myself as like a CEO or a company leader or whatever. Um, you know, I show up every day to this place where most people are my age um, and they're great people and I love them and I want to hear about what they did over the weekend. And I just kind of want to hang out and chat with them. But I know that like, you know, I also have to abide by that kind of um, those, those lines drawn. So, um, and with that, I, I did a ton of people management just kind of by feel like I'm a very trusting person. I'm a, I'm a very like people first person, you know, um, I'm not a here. Well, here's the employee handbook. And if you can't follow it, then you're fired. Like that's, it's just not my nature, but you have to adopt some level of that if you're going to survive. So that's been the single greatest challenge. Um, and there's all sorts of things I've, I've done to, I don't even want to use the term overcome because it's still such a, a work in progress. Um, but yeah, I mean, learning the industry that you're in, learning the company, figuring out how to profit in a business. Um, there's all kinds of textbooks for that and coaching you could get, whatever. And there is for people management too, but it's so specific to you and your circumstance and your company that, um, yeah, I've, I've found it to be really, really challenging. Yeah. People management is one of those soft I also, skills, right? Yeah. And so it's like ironic that I'm like, oh, I have all these great soft skills. And then that's the one thing that I've, I've, <laughs> you know, really struggled with. But, um, I think too, like, I, I don't know if this is, this is lame, but it's, you know, it's my truth. I'm, I'm a girl. I'm very emotional. Um, I, it's, it's hard for me to have a negative reaction with an a negative interaction with an employee and go home and pretend it ever happened. And I'll bring it home. And my fiance will be like, why are we still talking about this? Like, I'm sure they forgot about it the second it happened. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I wish it wasn't that way, but it's my truth. It's how I am. I take those things to heart. Um, I, I take everything to heart and that's, that's been really hard. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think a lot of people, you know, I've been on several like, I'll call them, I guess I've been in communities with people who are like focused on business buying on several occasions, speaking to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the number one question people always ask is like, what if everybody quits as soon as I buy the business? Mm -hmm. And my answer to them is yep. always like, well, are you going to let them quit? <laughs> like, are you going to let everybody yeah. quit the day you buy the business? Or like, what are you going to do ahead of time to prevent that from happening? And I think that's one of those areas that like your nature of who you are. And I can say this because I know Tato pretty well like your nature of who you are and just being honest and authentic and just who you are. Like that's the number one most important thing to retaining people is like, they just want to see you. It is. I agree. They don't want it. They don't want to see yeah. a facade. They don't want you to come in and pretend like, you know, everything and you have everything figured out. It's like, yeah. Hey, I'm here. I'm going to learn a lot from you. I think I have some skills I can bring to the table too. We're going to collaborate together. And along the way, we're going to figure everything out. And you know, my door's open. If you have questions, if you don't like yep. something, if you're not sure about something, like, please bring it up. And then reacting in a way that confirms that they can trust that that's how you're going to react. And it's like, that's, I mean, so while well, you've had to figure it out, and I think you were a little hard on yourself in terms of your ability to figure out, you, you've Probably. been incredibly successful at it. Like, I mean, there are real businesses where people go in, they buy it, and they instantly want to like implement their systems and their process and procedure. And they're very yeah. like, MBA about it. Yep. Right? Like that's the best way I can say it. And yep. it's like, and they drop half their staff. Cause it's like, Nope, they're used to working for a family owned company where, you know, they barbecued together yeah. and like hung out. And then you come in and you're like, mm -hmm. here's middle management and here's this and here's this and here's your handbook. Yeah. And Nope. You can't wear shorts to work. And like, nobody wants to just come in and say like, I don't have it all figured out guys. We're going to do it together. I have a vision totally. for where I want this thing totally. to go here we go. And like, mm -hmm. that's definitely, yep. I think you need to give yourself a little more credit there that you did that really, really well. And it's incredible that you've been able to, or you retained, I believe all your staff is what I assume from the conversation, or at least the majority, those that you wanted to retain. Yes. And, uh, yeah. So there were three yeah. employees, there were three employees when I came in and one, one had already said that he was going to go to college. So I kind of like, don't count him. He, I came in he was like, Hey, just, you know, August 31st, is my last day school starts September 1st. Um, so then I was left with two 
And one I did eventually fire, um, which, you know, should have fired him sooner or like just absolutely not a culture fit for kind of me and the place that, you know, I was making this to be. Um, and the other is my business partner now. And to the point about your, you know, honesty, um, I recognized pretty quickly that this kid was, you know, a total superstar. There's a million great things I could say about him. Um, and I sat him down and I was like, I'm going to call a spade a spade. This place doesn't survive if you walk out the door. I don't know what I'm doing. And no matter how much learning I could do in a short amount of time, no one in this moment, no one can replace you. Um, but what I can tell you is that I bought this place to change my life personally and financially, and I will absolutely devote myself to doing the same for you. And here's exactly how I'll do it. If you partner with me to make this place, you know, a, a company we can be proud of. And that was enormously successful for me. And frankly, like, if not the key, one of the top three keys to like where I am today. And also too, he's like one of my best friends now and like, I wouldn't want to show up here any, every day without him anyways. Um, but, you know, in that moment, yeah, it was just me being like, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't know shit. Um, so don't leave. And, you know, here's where we're going to go together. I love that so much. So much of yeah. so much of good people management is just honesty and clear expectations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being cognizant in not cognizant, that's the wrong word, being self-aware in your response to people when they say things you don't like or don't want to hear. Like if you can do those three yeah. things well, like setting clear expectations, being honest and, you know, being self-aware enough to respond in a way that's respectful of the other person, even if you don't like what you hear, like you're going to make it <laughs> like you're going to be OK with people. They, they, mm -hmm. There's really not like I, I always laugh yeah. at like the studies, these big consulting firms and big ad firms do on like what are the number one people reasons leave people leave jobs and all this all this statistics and data. And I'm like, I can tell you it's because they work for a jerk. They, or they work for someone who's entitled or thinks they know it all. Or like there's so many simple things that if you just do the basics right, you're going to have the right people aligned with you. I am curious if you're willing to go into any details about, you know, you keep calling him business partner, like what kind of a partnership arrangement mm -hmm. you guys have. Um, yeah, totally. Know. So very coincidentally, he... Yeah, he, very coincidentally, he's actually the stepson of the guy I bought the business from. So the situation was such that the owner I bought from uh, started this company 35 years ago and Oprah, uh, owner operated it from day one, never moved it into any type of next level of a business, right? Um, ran it as a quote unquote hobby business forever. Um, he was always the guy in charge. He made all the decisions, blah, blah, blah. He didn't delegate anything. Um, and then like two years before I bought it, he knew that he wanted to start retiring. He had health issues and whatever. And, it's to this day, not totally clear to me though. I can make some guesses, but that's a whole other thing. It's not totally clear to me why he didn't recognize that while they're not blood related, you know, they are related by marriage. This kid is amazing. Instill the, instill the knowledge in him to be able to run the company and carry on the family legacy. Well, he didn't, he chose not to do that. Um, this gentleman, you know, was young, right? He was never going to qualify for a loan or anything like that. Um, so, but he had legacy knowledge, you know, it's been in his, this business has been in his family that his mom married into, you know, forever. Um, so <sighs> bottom line, I obviously came in and gave him a huge raise. Like I was like, oh my God, you're so underpaid. This is insane. So I gave him a huge raise, but most importantly, I said, look, um, this company currently is really not profitable. Like this, the, the numbers here basically suck. Um, and so here's what I want to get to. And I'm going to bonus you on that net profit. Um, and that bonus structure is 3% of net profit quarterly. Um, and there are some things that that's basically the crux of it. Um, Cause I had said to him, I was like, you know, here's what we're going to need to do in order to get to a place of acceptable profitability or exciting profitability. And it's going to be on your back, right? You're, you're going to do the hard work, you know? Um, but here's how, here's how you're going to benefit. Um, and then some side effects of that, these weren't intentional, but what came about was um, he now has a company vehicle 
It's a huge, he loves that. It's a huge benefit to him. He basically was given a Ford F-150 for free. Um, you know, I pay for his health insurance now, um, which, you know, doesn't probably seem profound, but for a small company, you know, that he, he wasn't going to originally ever get that offer, but mm-hmm. I do now. Um, and frankly, uh, the thing that is probably most important though, the least quantifiable is his autonomy. Um, I never ask where he is or what he's doing or why he's doing what he's doing ever. Uh, he makes his own schedule. He tells me like, obviously he's here during business hours cause his job is here. You know, he can't really like work remotely, but you know, the, it's the non-traditional, like, you know, he tells me, he lets me know, you know, well, okay, I'm in charge. Um, but just in essence, um, you know, he, he has what feels like a career job, even though like technically we work in general labor manufacturing, you know, but he has, he has a career path to leadership at this company um, that, you know, I think he would struggle to find elsewhere. Yeah, that's super cool. I just, I want to point that out. I, I asked you that question for a very specific reason. Cause like a lot of times when I talk to business owners about, especially people who are going to acquire business or maybe have a business that they're struggling to kind of like pull themselves out of a little bit. And like, they feel like they're having to do everything. Usually what happens is it's, there's no, there's a, they expect a lot of their employees and they expect their employees to be as accountable for the business as they are as the business owner, but they're not yeah. aligning incentives with the employee to do that. Yeah. And so, you know, usually that comes at a cost. Like, I mean, I, I, this might be a limited mindset, but I tr- actually believe nothing's free. Like everything has some costs. Mm-hmm. Some of it's more tangible than others, but like, I feel like a lot of business owners who struggle to escape the business or like get to where they can focus on the business and not in the business or those who struggle to retain employees after acquisition, whatever the case might be, is that they're not willing to give up anything. You know, it's like, nope, I'm going to hoard this. I'm going to hoard all the profits for myself. I'm going to hoard all the equity for myself. I'm going to hoard all the health insurance for myself. I'm going to hoard every penny that comes from this business is going to directly benefit me and they're going to get paid the bare minimum. Like whatever, whatever yep. indeed tells me the salary ranges for their job is what I'm going to pay them. And, you know, if I pay them at the top end of that pay spectrum, then they might not go anywhere else. The reality is pay is only yep, a very, very, very small fraction of why people stay at jobs. It's not nearly as important as a lot of yep. people make it out to be. And so, yeah, yeah I mean, I, think, sure. I wanted to, ha- I, I had an assumption that there was some sort of profit sharing component, some sort of alignment of incentives that yeah. makes that work and makes them really want to stay in your hand. And I feel like that's where a lot of people miss. So kudos to you on that too. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. No, you know, Andrew and I have a similar, it's different, but it's, it's similar in that, like, you know, I wanted a partner because I didn't want to run the business. And so I had to align incentives for Andrew to be willing to do the work that it takes to run a company. Cause I've got another business that I run. I can't run both of them. Yeah. And so, you know, mm-hmm. and finding the right person, once you identify them, it's like, okay, then you've got to be willing to share. Like you've got to be willing to give something up or you can't have the expectation that you're going to be able to do the things and work on the business the way you want to work on it. If you're not willing to give up something in exchange. Yep, absolutely. So I, I, I wanted to ask that question because that's a good, a really good point for our listeners and anyone that's acquiring a company or struggling to get out of it is like, Take a really good hard look at your management incentives and the people who are running the company. You you know, you can raise your expectations yeah. as you raise the alignment of incentives. You cannot raise the expectation without also a corresponding raise in incentives. I love that. You know, Tato, a lot of times we'll talk with people and we'll we'll work with clients or, you know, friends of ours and we'll talk with them about kind of like leveraging people. Leveraging kind of has a negative connotation, but that is mm-hmm part of it, right? Like how can we positively leverage the people that it's going to take to run our business? Like very few businesses don't run with some form of employee or people, you know, kind of running it and being the machine behind it. So I think you really did a smart thing there early on addressing that and being like, Hey, who's my key person? (laughs) Because this is going to collapse if he's not here. And then how can we grow from there? So awesome. You mentioned a couple of other maybe key points, things that unlocked uh, kind of the next level for you. So that was one, you said there might be a couple others. So I want to hear about those um, before we move on. There's, there's so much, there's so many like little steps you have to like take and overcome that Mm -hmm. like, that lead up to like the keys and, you know, we couldn't possibly spend the time to go through them all. 
Um, but you know, I, I never want to sound simplistic because it's the furthest thing from that, right? Like I literally had to learn every step of everything. But when I finally had my sea legs under me, the two biggest things were a figuring out how, and this is different for every business, figuring out how I was going to find the best team. Um, and I took a little bit of a unique approach to that and it's worked out wonderfully for me. And then once I had great people and like, it's still very much like a work in progress. Like I definitely still do too much of certain things and not enough of other things. And that's an imbalance that I'm, I'm working on, but I at least have a handful of just like awesome people who show up every single day, no matter what, and not just show up, but really show up. And that's just, it makes or breaks you. Um, so that, and then coupled with that, once I, once I had like the knowledge of what the hell we do and then some awesome people to show up every day and do the things that we do, then it's okay. Do we make any money? And I realized that really we didn't, um, or it's not that we didn't, but we were not operating it profitably or efficiently. Uh, but we, you know, we had the, the puzzle pieces to, to make that happen. So then I had to really learn what it is that I needed to do to run a profitable business. I know that sounds ridiculous. Like, yeah, no, duh, that's, you know, what business is, but it's a lot harder in practice. So I had to take a good look at like, okay, I have all these puzzle pieces. Why, why is it not translating to the bottom line? And how do I make it not just a number on a PL, but an actual dollar amount that I pull out of my business and put into my own pocket to take back to the reason I even did this in the first place, which was to go buy more real estate. You know, I, I, until recently have taken like a two year hiatus from buying anything that has been like so hard for me, you know, um, I'm just sitting on the sidelines, not buying stuff, you know, that wasn't the bargain. Um, so those were like the couple of the key things is, you know, bringing in, bringing in great people and then figuring out what we need to do to really like pull the money out of the business. For everybody listening, Tato, small businesses, SMBs, you can tell in the way Sharks felt like realizing that the number on the bottom of your P&L does not translate to dollars in your pocket. And that feeling of like, I think every business owner goes through it and it, and it never ends by the way. So if you think you're through it, it doesn't end. Once you unlock the next phase, it's the next yep. phase of figuring out how do I get those dollars to translate to money so in my true. pocket. Yeah. And it's a constant cycle. Yeah. And anyone who tells you differently is probably lying again. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to point that out. Like that's a very clear indication that Tato is in the business, like operating just to have that recognition of like, okay, now we got to figure that out and then be able to figure it out and say, okay, now cool. We're actually making money. This money is actually able to be distributed to me and however your entity set yeah. up and however you pay yourself. Like I can actually take that money yep. out of the business, put it in my pocket and utilize it for real estate and continue to grow the business, continue to invest in things. And like figuring out that puzzle is like a huge step. And most yeah. people think that's going to be simple. You know, it's when you sit back and look at spreadsheets, it seems very easy when you're actually in the weeds, like, okay, yeah. a plan on paper is one thing. A plan in action is a different, is a very different thing. Amen. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so just point that out to everybody. I was like, I just wanted to highlight, like, if you ever, if you question Tato's authenticity, that's about as authentic as it gets. Like you're <laughs> in, in every business struggles with that. I don't care. I don't care how big your business is at every phase, there's a new level of that, that you try to unlock. And then you get to a phase where it's like, yep. shoot, I'm not smart enough to figure this out anymore. Like I need to hire yeah. people to actually help me figure this out now because my brain yeah, sure. thinks like small business and now we're enterprise level or whatever, right? Like there's different levels yep. to it. So that huge win again, I want to talk about like, you know, we've spent a lot of time kind of on the early struggles and challenges. Well, like, mm -hmm. talk to us about where you are now, like where, where you are now, where you're going, you know, what you're focused on. It kind of sounds like you've got, you know, as best as most of us can in business, like a pretty level, you know, stable, mostly business, it sounds like. And you probably got some big aspirations and big objectives. And I'm curious to hear about kind of where you are now and where you're going. Yeah, I feel like I have a really, really good grasp on my place in the industry and how to sell our company and our product. Um, I have, like I said, I, I have great people on staff. Um, my 
focus is kind of multifold right now. First and foremost, my biggest focus for 2024 is taking money out of the business. That that has been what I have been laser focused on. Um, how do we run at the most profitable state? And then how am I actually extracting those dollars and putting them into real estate? Um, and we've had a, um, a great run at that the last few months. I was going to say it's been a great year. It has been a great year in a ton of ways. I haven't made a million dollars, but there's been tons <laughs> of wins. Um, but specifically the last few months, I've really gotten this great uh, confident groove of that, um, those profitability keys. And then, like I said, pulling the money out. Um, I I'm also slowly trying to figure out these things are related, right? Like how am I evolving in what I'm doing as like a business leader every day and where am I going? And then like, who's who, to whom am I delegating those tasks that I'm eventually leaving? My, life is at this crossroads personally and professionally in a good way in that I'm getting married in two months. Um, and we're going to probably have kids soon because we're not like super young anymore. So that, that has been an impetus to where am I going? Like I've always, you know, you, you should think about that every day. Where are you going? Right. You should be going somewhere always. Um, but what is what does that look like for me? And that's a very unanswered question, right? Um, I have no idea what it's like to have kids, uh, just in general, but then also with a business and what have you. Um, also, my fiance and I quit our jobs at the same time and went out on our own at the same time. So we've been going through this like evolution and journey together of figuring out separately but together, like what are we doing as entrepreneurs, and then how do we how do we converge in our marriage as entrepreneurs and as partners to like be like the strongest, most dynamic duo we can possibly be. And again, just in recent past, we've really started like getting some serious momentum in that way. Um, and that has been so fun. And like I said, we're just like at the beginning of that. Um, so all these like things that I've worked on in life the last few years are kind of all coming together um, and converging and, um, and all are all contributing to the, to the, where are you going now? And the short answer is I really have no effing idea. Um, I never really know, but the, the long answer is that, um, I want to, it's what every business owner wants, right? I want to feel like every day I'm, I'm doing the most high leverage activities, um, and the, across all the boards, like at, at this business where I'm at right now in my relationship, which, which doubles as a romantic partnership, but also very much a business arrangement, um, as a, as a mom, soon to be mom, you know, um, and do I feel like I'm doing all the most high leverage activities because so long as every single day you're doing the most high leverage activities, six, the outcome of success is completely inevitable. Like I truly believe that, um, if you take the right actions, your outcome is, is certainty. Um, so just making sure that like that I'm moving in that direction. I don't know if that makes sense, but it makes perfect sense to me. It's like, you know, you're, you're honestly, what I'm hearing you say is you're kind of relishing in the unknown while knowing what you do have to do. Like, I don't really know what, you that know, that was so well said. Yes. I need months. to take that. Yeah. 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 Relishing in the unknown. Yep. Well, just knowing that the actions you take every day are going to get you there. Like, I mean, I think that's a lot of yes. uh, entrepreneurship is, is that right? There are a lot of entrepreneurs who have completely stopped setting goals. And it's like, cause I want that. What I do know is I'm going to be successful if I do this, this, and this every day. What I don't know is yeah. if I set a target yeah. of, you know, $10 million in revenue, am I going to hit it? Like, I don't know. But I do know if I, yep. you know, do the important sales calls every day and do my outreach to my clients yep. and, you know, leverage my brand and get exposure and whatever. I know those activities are going to lead to financial success. I know in my relationship, if I invest time in connecting with my romantic partner, like every day, and I know if we go on dates and I know if we're sharing our feelings openly and not letting resentment build, like that leads to happy 
relationships, right? <laughs> like totally, I, like all of those things. Totally. But you don't know, like, is it going to be the perfect marriage where you guys, you know, have seven lake houses and live a dream life where you travel all the time? <laughs> who knows? Maybe, maybe. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe it won't be. Maybe you don't want that. But what you do know is, if I do these actions every day, then I'm going to get a good outcome. And so I love that. That's yeah. a beautiful way to say that. I think too people, many people, I think it holds people back because they can get so focused on trying to predict the future instead of just focusing on what can I do right now? What can I do today? Mm -hmm. What can I do tomorrow? What can I do the next day? What can I do consistently? And I think too, um, and every person's situation is different, right? And so you just have to take that with a grain of salt. But I, what I get asked most often is, so what are you doing? Are, are you buying and holding and you're just like an absentee owner or are you exiting? And my answer is I try to make decisions in my business every day as if I was going to do one of those two things, right? Because you have to do similar things in order to achieve either of those. Um, but I'm not committing to either one because really what I what I'd rather have is figure out how I have it all, so to speak. I'm a high earning individual um, and my fiance is a very high, very high earning individual. He's done wonderfully in his entrepreneurial journey. Um, but the business is our tax shelter, which we first, this was our first tax year that we really got to like execute on and that and see the awesome benefits of shelter. And um, my high leverage activities bring real estate in the door for us. He is a less general contractor. He does all of our innovations. So I find the properties, you know, he, he redoes them for, you know, minimal cost because his labor, you know, he doesn't have to pay for it. Um, and so we're acquiring, acquiring real estate much more quickly. Um, and we're doing all of that, like, you know, as our own bosses, like, that's just like this amazing blend of like all the things we've always wanted. And so people get really hung up, like you said, Lucas, on like, oh, I want a $10 million exit or this or that, or like, what's, what's the huge like moment you're, you're working up to? And it's like, well, maybe I'm just optimizing every moment, right? I love that. I love that. I think a lot of, I love like what, I, what first came to mind when you were talking about like how you look at it is optionality. And when I was thinking, this is a thought I've, I've never said this to anyone. It just came to me. And I think you inspired the thought in me, Tato is like, you can't quantify the flexibility of having options. It's very hard to quantify, right? Yeah. If you decided, you know, six months and if, if, if today you didn't know you were going to sell your business, but what you knew is I'm going to run the best business I can today. In six months, you're like, hey, I really want to sell the business. I'm done. Like, I'm, we are going crazy in real estate. I'm all in focus on real estate. We don't need this distraction anymore. I'm going to sell it. You would have a good business to sell. Would you maybe maximize every single penny on the sale because you were really watching your expenses all year? Like, you know, like, you know, I've bought a lot of businesses. So I know owners a lot of times like, oh, we're just not going to fix anything. So the P&L looks better to increase the value of the business on the sale. Like you're not optimizing for a sale necessarily, but you're still going to have a very good business mm -hmm. to sell because you ran it like a good business every day. And yep. you, might, you might not maximize that, but you're, how do you quantify the optionality in? I could sell it or I don't have to. And I think that's a very high mm -hmm. leverage position to be into where it's like, I get to decide. And I will tell you, yep. every day is different. I go through... I've for the last year or more, every week feels different. Some weeks I'm like, I'm selling this thing every day. Tato, probably when we first yeah. met, I was probably saying that. And then I end up buying yep. more stuff. Yep. And it's like, and then the next week it's like, oh yep. no, we're going to the moon with this baby, like all the yep. way. And then yep. the next week it's like, oh, this is frustrating. I'm going to sell this thing, <laughs> you know? But like, there's so much yep. freedom and power so in the optionality that I don't think enough people quantify. Yeah. It's like they want to go into something with a fixed strategy. Here's how I'm going to maximize dollar value of the company. And then I'm going to do this. And I think that's so restricting mm -hmm. that you're, you're missing the part that's hard to quantify, which is there's leverage and having flexibility. I get to decide. Yep. You want to give me an offer to buy a business? Cool. It better be a good offer because I don't have to sell, you know, or I don't want to sell. Yep. So convince me or yeah. Um, mm you know, life happens and this is really hard with kids. And, you know, we've got a good thing going in the real estate space and it gives me more freedom. And so now I want to sell, but I still don't have to because I've got this business partner who, Hey, you know what? I'll just pay him more and he can step up and take on more of my responsibilities or I'll hire another person. Like that optionality gives you so yeah. much freedom 
like sometimes people fix themselves yep. to a strategy and I think they hold themselves back to be honest. So I love that for you. Amazing. And thank you yep. for inspiring that thought. I never thought about it that way. I love that. You're so welcome. It's amazing. Tato, we're running out of time, aren't we, Andrew? Things. We could talk. We could literally um, talk all day. I could. Yeah, I could yeah, talk yeah. with Tato on this. We podcast could literally all talk day. all day. Like exactly, <laughs> exactly. I knew that would happen, yeah. but I love it. I have nowhere to be. Well, maybe we can have you on for round two uh, sometime. Uh, but one of the things that I, I wanted to touch on before we let you go is what the way that you were talking about. You've got your work. You've got your you know, fiance, soon to be husband, you guys are gonna have kids. Like one of the big shifts when I went from a W2 to being kind of, you know, in nurse and so in this entrepreneurial environment is like, there was a clear delineation a lot of the time for me between work and home. And like, yeah. for the most part, even when you're in a managerial position or you have responsibilities, like I did, there was a line and it was a clear yep. line. And now the line is dashed. Uh, or, you know, I've got these different capsules and we're like, yeah. it's all connected. And I think the way that you're approaching that is really inspiring because like your awareness of that, these things are all like one organism yeah. that is like living, breathing and, and shifting and changing on a daily basis really puts, gives me some clarity on like how I've been approaching and how I've been feeling, you know, the last three and a half, you know, almost four years in nurse. And so it was like, I, you can't turn it off necessarily. I just got back right. from vacation and like, there was no way I was going to go on a five day vacation with my family and not check my emails because yeah. I needed to make sure things were moving. Like I didn't yep. do the normal level of work that I do yep. normally, you know, but I was, you, you can't turn any one of those things off a hundred percent at at all times, you know? And so there's a difference between being a W2 where like, Hey, works at work. I'll pick that up tomorrow versus going home and, and being able to shut that down and and then being an entrepreneurial environment where like i can't i'm i'm gonna put my phone on do not disturb you know when i'm sleeping but if i'm awake i need mm -hmm. to be kind of aware of what's yeah. happening in all these phases of my life mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah. i mean so. i feel like i feel like when you're in a w2 like inevitably you're just you're um you're just kind of tendering someone else's destiny you know that that's what a w2 is um and when you're an entrepreneur you're tendering your own destiny and um yeah i think people who are on the other side of it and don't understand your point of view um they would be like oh my god like we actually get this a lot chad and i like all you guys do is work and it's kind of like well that that's true right like when we we will literally have 12 to 14 hour days we will come home and then we will spend our only waking hours talking about those days and all of the various things that happened and what we're doing and like blah 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 whatever but um like we love it, you know, I, we don't love every day or every minute for sure. I come home crying a lot, you know, or sometimes I'm like, okay, let's like literally talk about anything other than this, like for sure. But for the most part, it's where we found each other. We found each other. Cause I was trying to hustle a business deal to him. Um, and so like, we met that way. We share those same interests. We both, you know, talk about the fact that like, we've never had partners so aligned with like our interests and, everyone wants to shame you for like not having any boundaries. I'm like, fuck boundaries. Why would I want that? Like I have no boundaries in my life, you know? And I love it. It's like, I don't know. It's just like this chaotic mess that I'm completely in charge of. And everything that I do is like for, you know, my own like destiny and benefit. So I think there's, it's just like the world wants to shame you for having yeah. dashed lines. And, you know, and maybe but, your, maybe your boundaries are like, Hey, we're just going to live a chaotic life. And you know, that is the boundary. Like we're yeah. not going to live life simply. What if your boundaries are the inverse of what most people think they should be? Like, I'm not going to settle. I love I'm that. not going to do totally. like, those are also boundaries, yes. right? They're just the inverse of what most people yeah. would think of as boundaries. But like, I love like Completely. what I want to end on. What I want to end on is just like, I think you did something so beautiful like Andrew was pointing out about like talking about like all these different er areas of life and how they kind of like culminate to this vision for your life. Um, and I think like one of the things that's hard in entrepreneurial relationships is like you want to do things together. And I, I think this could be for women too. I don't want to speak for women, but I know for men specifically, and I've seen a lot of men challenge this, like they want to build something with their partner. And in a man's mind, a lot of times that is like, you work in the company with me. 
And so like, it can feel like they're going to be really blurred yeah. lines, but there are so many ways. And what I want to highlight is how you illustrated you and your, and what's his name, man? Chad? Is that what you said? Chad. Is it Chad? Yes. Chad. Okay. So you and Chad. Yes, America's douchiest name, but he's a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> the the unchadliest Chad. <laughs> Correct. Yes. <laughs> um, but anyway, so like you guys are both building this huge entrepreneurial vision for your future together, but you both have your own things and your own ways of doing it. And that can look yeah. different for everybody, you know, in some more like traditional marriages for lack of a better term or whatever, that could be just like one spouse really supporting the other as they're out hustling and doing it and really yeah. trying to like lock down the things mm -hmm. for part for partnerships where both people want to be like going all out all the time. It could be, okay, well then we have to collaborate on how can we raise our kids the best we can raise them and instill the values we want them to have when yep. we're both hustling and having our own thing. And like, but that partnership can take yeah. so many different shapes and building together doesn't necessarily mean you're doing the same thing or focus on the same outcomes or that the same things are always important to you at the same level okay. it just means your big collective vision is one thing and you're both going to do your part in getting there and work and that's how you build together right and like i just wanted to highlight that because that's something we yeah. talk a lot about on this i think you pr brought up like a good opportunity for that of like something you know courtney and i have had to figure out is like how do we build yeah. together in a way that feels together for both of us and you know yep. how do we do it in a way that it, you know, creates the family life we want to have and instills the values we want our kids to yep. have and allows us to enjoy each other and be passionate about things together. And they don't always have to be the same, but like, how do we do it? And you, the beautiful thing on entrepreneurship is you get to decide, like you get to decide what that looks like. And every positive outcome and negative outcome is a hundred percent a reflection of your vision and your effort and nobody else's. And that's the beautiful thing that I just kind of want to end on that. Like, I think is just really fun, honestly, Tato, knowing you from your journey from, you know, several years back till now, like, it's just very inspiring to see. And I just love that for you. I'm so happy for you. just wanted to celebrate that for a minute, like how you're looking at that and doing and I know there's struggles and challenges and you cry and all that good stuff. But it's really cool to see as someone who knows you that like, <laughs> you, you, you've got that. That's what it's about. That is literally what entrepreneurship is about. And it's, it's just really cool to see. So yeah. wanted to celebrate that with you. Thank you. So Love much. that. So sweet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I hope that, I hope this particular episode can bring some clarity to people who feel like they're kind of like, you know, grasping at those sort of intangible gray areas for sure. If you had to tell, we'll just Absolutely. let you, we'll, we'll wrap it up with one answer from you. You can end us. If you had to, tell somebody on the fence about jumping into entrepreneurship from a high paying corporate job that has, you know, whatever dynamic they have going on in their life. If you had to give them yep. whether a piece of encouragement, advice, whatever that is that you want to yep. share, what would you tell them? Yep. My answer to this always is you Nike swoosh, just fucking do it. Like there is no, pill there's no magic thing there's nothing you'll read nothing you'll hear nothing you just have to do it and some people are like yeah but my circumstance is such that i don't care don't give a shit if you don't want to do it that is totally fine and i will still respect the hell out of you and i want to hear about where you're at in whatever journey you choose in a couple years and i'm going to be just excited for you but if you do want to do it then you just have to fucking do it and like I don't have anything to talk to you about until you're willing to go jump off that cliff. I love that. Beautiful. I, love, I would, I would echo that answer. Andrew would probably confirm that's probably usually my answer to people too. It's like, just, just, if you're talking about doing it, either do it or don't like, yeah. it's, but just go right. like there's the, you're never going to know the answers. You're never going to have the perfect solutions. You, you just got to go. You just got to do it. Yep. Love it. Love yep, it. Inspiring, exactly. Tato. So good Thanks to have so. you. Um, yeah, Thanks, Andrew, you anything, anything you want to wrap up with? No, this was amazing. So many, you know, golden nuggets of, of, uh, of truth out there. You know, we've had a lot of guests on and you have been the most real Tato. So we appreciate that. Jeez. Well, that's a double-edged sword, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're a straight awesome. shooter. We appreciate that. <laughs> awesome. All thank right. you guys so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode of So You Can Grow. 
Please be sure to like, subscribe, and review wherever you get your podcast. To connect with us, visit nourishandso.com slash podcast or email us at podcast at nourishandso.com.